Hello, thanks for being in a new video. This time I have a full review of the POCO M6 Pro. Let's get started. This device has another special edition with support for 5G networks, so do not confuse it because in this case we are talking about the edition 4G. It is a device focused on the mid-low range but honestly has virtually everything we could ask. So from now on I'm going to tell you that it is a highly recommended device but anyway I'm going to show you absolutely everything about it so you can see if it really is what you are looking for or not. Its launch price in Mexico has been 3,999 pesos for the model with 8 GB of RAM and 256 GB of storage. On the screen you saw the reference price in dollars, although the prices here are not the same as there, but at least in Mexico it has a considerably low price compared to all its competitors. In fact, there is also the addition with 12 GB of RAM and 512 GB of storage increased to a price of 4,999 pesos. Again on screen you see the reference price in dollars and considering the competition that has at least here in Mexico is the best you'll be able to find. Virtually no competitor will be able to offer you something better than it. But anyway, come with me to know it, point by point. Let's start with a look at the front where we find a very advanced design with quite reduced visals even in the lower bezel which is where usually many devices have the largest bezel. But notice how this device despite being very economical comes with a screen that takes advantage of practically the entire front. It's definitely a super attractive point and also consider that it comes protected with Gorilla Glass 5. This is something that we are not going to find in this price range either, so it is one of its strongest points without a doubt. On the right side we find a power button and volume buttons. At the top is placed a microphone as well as the infrared, the secondary audio output and the headphone jack. On the left side is the tray where we can place both micro SD card and nano SIM card. And at the bottom is placed another microphone, the USB-C port and the main speaker. It is even very thin with 7.98 of thickness and is considerably light with 179 grams in weight. Possibly one of the few points that we can criticize is its back cover which gets very stained with fingerprints and also has a finish that looks not very premium but honestly in this price range it is not something we could demand. Although more and more manufacturers put a lot of detail and care to the design but Poco puts priority to absolutely everything else and the design is considered as less relevant. And let's face it, most people are going to use it with a case on and in this case Poco includes the case in the box. And with the case on, it looks much better with a matte design that doesn't pick up finger marks. This back cover is plastic and in addition to this edition I have in my hands which is black, it is available in blue and purple. And note how on the camera side there is a strip with a slightly different color which in the other editions is much more noticeable. Finally, in terms of ruggedness it's not IP68 certified so it's not submersible but it is IP54 certified so it's splash resistant. And in this price range that's a certification that again is very rare. The screen is another of its strengths. It is 6.67 inches with full HD plus resolution, like many screens used by Xiaomi. But it stands out that in this low price range there is already a screen quality of this height. Since we are in front of an AMOLED panel, which has intense colors, high contrasts and in fact also its pixel density is considerably high taking into account its price. So the level of detail is very good even in the smallest details or in letters with small font size. It also has good viewing angles, so even if you see the content from the side it will have good visibility. And in fact it gives us a maximum peak of 1300 nights on the screen, so even using this display outdoors you will have a considerably comfortable viewing. The minimum brightness is also very comfortable for using this device at night or in dark environments. And note that it also has a sunlight mode that's going to raise the brightness even higher for those special occasions. Although by default it is best to have the automatic brightness enabled. You will also find the reading mode, which actually allows you to add a bit of paper texture to the screen for a very comfortable viewing, and it has several color calibrations for you to choose the one you like best, whether you want very saturated colors or colors that are a little more natural. You also have a specific color temperature calibration. So every way you look at it, it's a very good quality display that also supports a refresh rate of up to 120 Hz. 
And that's something very rare to see in the range in conjunction with an AMOLED display. Usually in this price range you can get to find 90 or 120 Hz displays, but they're not going to be AMOLED. So here we have absolutely everything that we could ask of a display which even has a touch sampling rate of 2160 Hz. So it can become very responsive to touches and gestures and this can be very useful for those who like to play games. So confirm that this screen is a very strong point in this device. The sound will also be one of the speakers, one on the bottom and one on the top. So, yes, we do have stereo sound and it is possibly the best sound in the range, with good stereo spaciousness and a sufficient presence of bass frequencies. So for the price, we could categorize this sound as excellent, although obviously it's not quite a high-end sound, but at this price, it's surprisingly good. How about listening to a small test, although it's not the same as listening to it live? In fact, it not only has good audio hardware, but also good software as it has access in sound effects to a 10-band equalizer, fully customizable. In this case, I prefer to turn up the bass a lot to make it even more noticeable. And the sound is definitely very nice, but you can adjust the audio completely to your liking, and it does feel like the speakers are responsive to each and every change. It also has Dolby Atmos support, no problem at all to have this slightly wider and stereo experience although it's not able to keep some apps playing on the phone and other apps playing on some Bluetooth speaker like you can find on Samsung devices. So that would be one of the few improvements we can find in this device. It does have a headphone jack to enjoy good audio quality. And in case you want to use Bluetooth headphones in addition to the SPC and AAC codec, it also supports the aptX codec, so you could connect some headphones with this good wireless sound resolution. Below you are going to listen to an audio recorded with the microphones of the cell phone. Esta es una prueba de audio grabada con los micrófonos del Poco M6 Pro, un dispositivo de gama media baja. Even the microphones have excellent audio pickup. The front camera is 16 megapixels with f2.45 aperture and autofocus, a camera setup we see on many Xiaomi devices. By default it does not have any quick access to the camera, but in the additional settings section you can configure this special shortcut, which can be by double pressing the power button, even when you have the screen on, although first the device will lock. Therefore, when you go backwards the lock screen will appear, but if you get to have this agility to quickly open the camera. Also, this gesture works when the screen is off, or you can select the other gesture to double press the volume down button inside the lock screen, but it seems to me that it is a much less fast gesture because you cannot use it from any other screen, but only from the lock screen. Still remember that these options come turned off, so you have to turn them on first. The photography experience is going to be considerably fast and snappy. If we hold down the shutter, it starts recording a short video of only 15 seconds, and in this case the front camera has no burst available. What we will find is a button in the lower right corner to access the beauty mode with different parameters, such as making the skin smoother, the face thinner, or the eyes bigger. So there are three parameters that we can use. And with respect to gestures or capture modes, notice that by default only the traditional shutter comes. But in the special settings we can enable easy capture by recognizing the palm, which can be very useful when it is difficult to reach the shutter with the finger. And in the more advanced settings we can also select that we can take a picture by touching any area of the screen or we can also create an additional shutter and to create it we just have to move the button up and now we can place it in any area we want to reach it more easily. And if we don't want it anymore we simply move it back to its original area. The front camera will obviously be simple. It has a fixed focus that gives a lot of priority to being close to the camera. So being at a short distance you do come out well focused, and at distances a little further away you start to lose a little level of detail, but I think it's something we could accept in this price range. Obviously it will not have ultra accurate colors or anything like that, but fortunately it does have automatic HDR and before taking the capture still does not look well balanced light and shadow, but after processing the truth is that the result is totally positive, so we cannot reproach anything. On the contrary, we congratulate Xiaomi for the good work done in these photographs backlit with the front camera.
Indoors, it still maintains acceptable photo quality, although there is much more noise present, but it still maintains good color saturation. And on the other hand, at night, the photography is very similar to indoors if you have any light source nearby, i.e. it still maintains good saturation, although there is more graininess present in the photo, but that is something we might expect in this price range. But one positive thing is that you can use the night mode even with the front camera, and the result, believe me, is much improved even when backlit. Look at the difference between a photo with the automatic mode and a photo with the night mode. Definitely that is highly recommended, although I do not really like the colors, but at the price we can forgive it. At night you can also take portrait pictures, although it is not so recommended because it comes out very low resolution and level of detail, but in the daytime there is better detail in the foreground, although even so, note that it is not able to detect objects well so they could be totally out of focus, resulting in a not very natural photograph. On the back we have three cameras. The first one is a 14mm that is an ultra wide camera with 8 megapixels in its sensor and f2.2 in its aperture. This lens has fixed focus so it is not so advanced but within the range it is appreciated to have this ultra wide camera. Then we will find the main camera of 24mm with 64 megapixels in its sensor. We have an f1.8 aperture, autofocus and optical stabilization. It is definitely a camera that surprises in this price range. In fact, having a high resolution sensor, Poco also considers a kind of virtual camera with 50 millimeters, that is, a 2 equis optical zoom, which would give us 12 megapixel photos with optical quality, keeping the same aperture, same focus, and same stabilization of the main lens. So, let's say you would have a good quality telephoto camera, and finally the last camera is just a 2 megapixel macro camera with f2.4 aperture and fixed focus. That macro camera for me is not that necessary but honestly I can't fault a lot of things about this phone because I like almost everything about it. Next we are going to test the capture speed that this device has by taking two shots trying to capture number one to see if it really has an agile capture or not. As you may notice, the device has a buffer to capture the picture even before you press the shutter. As in my two attempts, the capture was done before I had specified. So it doesn't capture the exact moment, but captures moments before. If you want, you could also slide the shutter to the right to have a burst of up to 20 pictures and through that burst you could capture the exact moment. On the rear cameras we also find access to beauty mode, but in this case only with a slider without multiple parameters. We will also have access to several color filters that we can apply in real time, but we cannot preview them all at the same time. If we tap on screen, we can adjust the focus and also the exposure, but if we want some more advanced settings we can go to the pro mode, which is going to offer us several settings, among them a maximum ISO of 6400 and a maximum shutter speed of 30 seconds exposure. So we have good parameters, although it does not allow us to capture photographs in RAW. One point of improvement is that in the main camera interface it is not able to detect documents, although it does have a special document mode so it is not so complicated but it could be improved. Remember that these documents can be perfectly exported to PDF. It even has a text recognition option directly from the application to extract it in digital format. On the other hand, it is able to immediately detect QR codes from the main camera interface. The device has a high resolution mode to capture photos at 64 megapixels, but honestly, you don't get to distinguish such a level of detail in this photo. It looks like a stretched 16 megapixel photo and not a 64 megapixel photo. Really, you're not gonna get as much detail as you should. Moving pictures could get tricky for you. Notice how in this case it doesn't have a good exposure as there are a lot of overexposed areas even though the whole area does come out well defined, but it definitely won't be one of its strongest points. Interestingly, the ultra wide camera does a better job in this type of action photography. Outdoor photos look to me to be of good quality. In automatic mode, the photos are 16 megapixels, and in this case we do have a good level of detail. The colors will not be too accurate, but I think they will be enough to give us a good quality photo. Although it may seem a bit of chromatic aberration, which may be natural in such an inexpensive device, but I like that we do not find considerable distortion at the edges, nor any kind of defect in the lens. 
The ultra-wide camera is immediately noticeable as having a totally different and much simpler color rendition, also with more chromatic aberration, but again it stands out that it has little distortion at the edges. So I think for the price range, in fact, it's a good picture. Indoors, the main camera seems to me to pick up the lighting well, eliminating quite a bit of the noise that is in the darker areas and maintaining saturation and level of detail well. The ultra-wide camera also performs well in these types of scenarios even though it doesn't have too much light. In backlight, the preview still doesn't look optimized, but the result is positive balancing well the highlights and shadows area after having processed the picture. Even the ultra-wide camera also maintains a good balance of highlights and shadows, although I insist that the color rendition can be a little weird and also may come to appear more chromatic aberration in these backlit photographs, but for the price, it is a good level camera. At night, we also have good quality pictures both with the main camera and the ultra-wide camera with really little noise present. Unless you want to zoom in a lot to notice details, you'll notice a bit of graininess. Even in some slightly darker areas, both cameras also maintain a good performance capturing light information well. Although obviously some slightly strange areas appear in the darker parts, but the result I insist is positive. With the night mode, there is not so much difference in this type of scenes, so it is not so advisable to use it. Where you will notice an important change when using night mode is when you use the 2x zoom setting. This picture you're looking at is without night mode. And now you're looking at it with night mode. And notice how much sharper and even better the picture becomes. In fact, I had forgotten to show you the results with the 2x setting, i.e. with the virtual 50mm camera, and it does maintain optical quality. In this case, it honestly looks like a good picture, so with the 2x setting, it does quite well. Just so you can sort of see the difference. This is a photograph with the main camera, this is a photograph with the 2x setting, and it does maintain good quality. Now this is a picture with the 5x zoom, where I still think it's a good result, and the maximum it gets is 10x, but the level of detail looks a little bit artificial. I still think it's a good zoom for the price range. In very low light conditions, the main camera still manages to recover some information, but even using the night mode, we will not find a good enough result, so it is not so recommended for this type of scenes, but they are very extreme, where we could only demand something better to much more expensive devices. The ultra-wide camera, even with the night mode, does not manage to get something, so in these conditions, it is not so recommendable. This camera also has the ability to adjust its focus for small objects in macro captures, and it is recommended to capture them with the 2x setting, which which keeps the quality of details and colors very good. This would be the result with the macro camera. And as you can see, it is inferior to the result that the main camera gives us. That's why I don't like to mention the macro camera. As an additional fact, if you don't like the way the pictures come out with the ultra-wide camera, because they have a little more noise and chromatic aberration, you can use the panoramic mode and believe me the quality will be much better, although you don't have as much vertical range, but the horizontal range can even be greater, and definitely the result is positive. If there are some areas where you can get to notice the merger between one and the other photograph, but overall I think the results are completely superior compared against what the ultra-wide camera offers us with quite rare colors. And finally, the portrait mode seems to me to work in good quality, even in quite complex conditions as in this one, where there are lights and shadows directly on the face. The blur is natural in the background and the edge detection also seems to be accurate as it is also able to detect the objects around us to keep the foreground in focus. So the results are positive with some slightly overexposed areas but overall for the price the portrait results are very good. Let's talk about video recording and the maximum quality supported by this device. All cameras have the ability to record in Full HD at 30 frames per second, but if you want to record at 60 frames per second, you can only do it with the main camera, as the ultra-wide camera does not have support for that frame rate per second. Note that in video recording, you also have access to color filters, and even beauty mode, although if you use beauty mode, the video resolution drops to HD. And when recording a video, we are going to have a slider for zooming, although we don't have quick shortcuts. You can also pause and resume recording, take some screenshots while recording, but you can't turn on the flashlight. This is a weak point, as other devices do allow us to turn on the flash without the need to first cut our video recording. 
But one positive thing is that within the pro mode you also have a video recording mode so you could move different parameters even while you are recording so it is definitely a highly advanced experience as this kind of features other manufacturers offer them only in their high-end devices. The video quality is going to be simple but acceptable. In this price range we could not get too demanding. The color representation is very similar to what we saw in the picture. That is, in the main camera we have a little more accurate colors without standing out too much in this aspect. Although when there is a lot of movement, you will notice that it is actually recording at 27 frames per second and not 30. Even the zoom is pretty bad in video recording. And if you record with the ultra-wide camera, you'll notice that the color rendering is much more inaccurate as we saw in the picture. And in this case it also lets you zoom in, but it's not going to switch to the main camera. So we have the cameras working separately and that makes it lose versatility and possibly this is another of its weaknesses. Indoors, the main camera performs well enough to try to hide the noise, although it is still noticeable in some areas but maintains color saturation well. On the other hand, the ultra-wide camera fails to eliminate noise completely and you notice quite a bit of grain in darker areas so you lose quite a bit of definition. In backlight, the main camera will give priority to fully illuminate the face, sacrificing several areas of the background so there are many overexposed areas when it detects a face, and that result is of course not so pleasant. On the other hand, the ultra-wide camera seems to have a slightly better balance even though it also gives priority to illuminating the face, but it seems to me that there are fewer overexposed areas in the background. Although obviously shooting with the ultra-wide camera is not a very good idea because it looks much lower quality in colors and because of the presence of chromatic aberration. At night the ultra-wide camera is going to be very weak in this aspect so there is a lot of noise present and little definition. In fact when some illuminated area appears it is not going to be able to balance lights and shadows well either. And in the darker areas obviously a lot more grain will appear, although not specifically noise but obviously there is little definition and little color saturation. The ideal at night will be to record with the main camera, which actually has a more accurate color pickup with these warm tones that we had at the time, and when some light area appears also try to make a good balance of light and shadow. And finally, in the darker areas it manages to recover a little bit more information although it's still quite low quality, but it's what one might expect in this price range. Fortunately it has optical stabilization and it also has digital stabilization. So when you're walking around I think it masks movement pretty well, but when you're running around you're obviously not going to have sufficient stabilization. With the ultra-wide camera we also have digital stabilization, but in this case we don't have optical stabilization. Even so, being a wider scene, it seems that the movements are better disguised even when you are running, but it is still not an extraordinary shot since it does not have an action mode. The fast camera can go from 4x, which can be very good for movements of people, or when you are walking and want a slightly accelerated scene, but can go up to 1800x, with which you could perfectly record the growth or deterioration of a plant. The focus can handle it quite well when it detects a face whether you are close or far away and that those movements are made with speed, so it really handles this section well in video recording, although with objects it can struggle a lot more, as opposed to faces, so with objects you need an exaggeratedly well defined line for it to focus automatically or else you will have to touch the screen for it to really focus, because with small objects it struggles a lot. Finally, the device offers HD slow motion at 120 frames per second, so it's basic slow motion, but there are many other competitors that don't offer slow motion. The front-facing camera lets you record at 30 frames per second and has good stabilization, although this causes the angle to be very tight, so you have to stretch your arm out a lot if you want to get in the frame. You're also going to notice some overexposed areas because it gives priority to lighting the face. Well, so if you're in some shadows, you're definitely going to notice that some of the background gets overexposed or burned out. So, it's not a very good camera, but for the price range we wouldn't expect better. Something to consider is that it doesn't allow you to disable stabilization, but if you record at 60 frames per second, you could have a slightly wider frame, although as it doesn't have stabilization, the movement feels very aggressive. Indoors there will be quite a bit of noise and grain in the darker areas, but something remarkable is that it maintains color saturation well, even in the darkest areas, so I was really surprised in this aspect.
And at night, if we have a good light source nearby, I think the result becomes still positive, but the more movement there is present, there will also appear a little more noise and the colors could come out a little altered due to the illumination of the screen. In darker areas, you will also notice a large presence of noise. And if there is little light present in the environment, obviously the camera is going to get to suffer much more with more presence of noise and a strange coloration in the face due to the illumination of the screen. This front camera does offer us a fast camera mode where you can use the camera setting as well. And the remarkable thing is that it does maintain stabilization, but it does not offer us slow motion, nor does it offer us dual camera mode to record both the front and main camera at the same. Time. This device comes with Android 13 and MIUI 14 for POCO. In this section we could also find some improvement, although it is getting quite demanding, but we would like it to arrive with Android 14 factory instead of Android 13. Still, in this device, Xiaomi has given a good promise with 3 years of software updates and 4 years of security patches, something that virtually no other manufacturer is going to offer you in this price range. Surely soon update to HyperOS, which is the new operating system from Xiaomi, with which possibly eliminate threats and fears of bugs that people can get to have. Because for no one it is a secret that many Poco devices can come to have various flaws in the software, although in this case I have not had any problems. The device has some features added by the software, such as the always on display, which will allow you to have some phrase or special clock face or even some special small drawing, even when you have the screen locked in order to continue displaying basic information such as time, battery or notifications. In addition, it also includes a floating windows and sidebar function, although you have to enable it because it is turned off by default. But in this sidebar, we can quickly open some shortcuts and notice how the applications are going to run in a floating mode. And here we can quickly click on any application and it will open in a floating mode, where it also allows us to resize the window. We can even leave a very tiny window in the top right corner, and we can restore it by clicking on it. Only in this case it only allows us to open two applications in this floating window format because if you try to open another one it will replace the previous one. Also YouTube does not support this floating window format although Instagram seems to support it. So there are still some small things to improve but definitely that it offers us good features. Interestingly it also includes a heart rate reader directly using the fingerprint reader that is integrated inside the display. So you can simply place your finger there and it will give you your heart rate after a few seconds. The operation is correct, although obviously the most appropriate in this type of measurement is that you have a specific monitor or even a smartwatch. Remember that it also has the My Remote app which will use its infrared that it has on the top, making this device a universal remote control. So you can select any brand of TV or other devices and with a simple setup process, you are going to be able to access your full remote control afterwards. This is a function that can become very useful because it not only works with televisions but also with air conditioners or other devices. Finally, regarding the added features, note that it has a photo editor with artificial intelligence. So it includes an object eraser so you could easily select an object that you want to delete so that automatically this device does the job for you. In fact, also, the eraser can automatically detect the people in your photo to try to remove them. Notice how it has detected me well, and if I press the X it will delete me, and it does a good job, honestly. Notice how also in the artificial intelligence options it has an option to completely change the sky and how it renders the colors. We're going to switch to a dusk style so that the change is even more noticeable. So I honestly think it can become quite useful for certain types of people who like to edit their photos. For example, it's able to add the moon in that part as well to give an interesting style to your photos. And as part of the interactions with the system, the device has an optical motor on the Z axis. So we won't find that kind of premium tapping that we can find on other cell phones when we get to the end of a list or when we scroll between other items as it's a pretty simple vibration motor. But in the price range it's business as usual. Overall we could say that this is a very modified system with various additions and so far I have not had any bugs or problems but it can always become a controversial point the software.
In addition, something that I have noticed annoying is that it has enough advertising which can sometimes be a bit complex to remove not only in the notification panel but even when accessing any other application such as the file manager could get to show advertising screens. And that definitely is an annoying experience but it is understood that it is to recover some of the money since the cell phone is extremely economical. This device has a fingerprint reader inside the screen that I had already shown you and it definitely responds very fast. In fact, I'm surprised how fast it responds, especially for the price it has. Generally, readers this fast are only found on more expensive devices, so it's definitely a great experience with the in-display fingerprint reader that supports up to 5 enrollments. In addition to this, it has facial unlock although it is only in two dimensions and as I always say, in this case, if your priority is security, it is best to use only the fingerprint unlock. It has an option to stay unlocked while connected to Bluetooth devices manufactured by Xiaomi, then somehow it has an intelligent unlocking but not as advanced as the one found in other Android devices. So this will be a point to improve and possibly one of its few weaknesses. Other devices allow us to stay unlocked depending on your location or other factors, but not this one. The password manager that this device has is Google's, and notice that it automatically fills in the information and that can be a dangerous security breach. So that this does not happen in the settings, you can go to the Google section and then within all services choose autofill and then autofill with Google. Finally, we access the preferences and in this section we can enable this option to tell it to first verify by fingerprint that it is you before filling in the information. So notice how we now have much greater security in the management of our passwords. Also within the file manager we will find a private file mode or secure folder which can be protected with a pattern other than your lock screen and obviously also through your fingerprint. Here you can store all your files considered private but we did not find a child mode where you give permission to access only some applications or you can set time limits so that can also be an improvement and possibly another of its few weaknesses. What we will find is the second space where we have applications completely separate from the first. You could have a space for work and another space for personal life and it also has the application lock function so that it again requests a pattern that can be different from your lock screen to have a second security filter in case you get to lend your phone to someone who wants to see information. It also has an antivirus although it is its own since it is not in collaboration with Avast or any other security company. And notice how it once again placed an advertisement for us. It also has the option to clone applications to use two instances of this application on the same device and if you lose your phone, you have the support of Google to try to find it through its own services. Although Xiaomi also has a specific implementation but it comes a little hidden within the account settings and then within Xiaomi Cloud, we will be able to activate these options. But it is curious that comes disabled, so it is very important that you enter to activate this option and give it all permissions if you want to have more chances to find your phone in case of any loss. Like any Android device today, it also has the functions of digital wellness, which will allow us to observe all the time we consume in certain applications and also parental control functions to set some time limits for your children. And it also has the emergency function to press the power button multiple times and make an emergency call. The battery is 5000 milliamps and in this case I think it performed well. Remember I do in this case two tests, first I'm running the battery drainer in the foreground and with this it supports 5 hours with 16 minutes. Which is what one would expect from a device with this battery. And having this app running in the background while we're watching YouTube videos in the foreground, it gave us a little bit more time coming in at 5 hours and 46 minutes. Although we have seen other devices that handle much better tasks running in the background so the battery is positive but I don't think it's one of its highlights. Anyway in the price range I insist that we cannot get too demanding and the battery if it comes to meet well. In fact it also has a traditional power saving mode for day to day use and an ultra power saving mode for emergency occasions. So definitely if you are well backed up in case you need a little more power at the end of the day. Its charger is 67 watts and is included in the box so it charges very quickly. With 15 minutes of charging in our test we got 39% power back and with 30 minutes it got up to 71%, finishing charging to 100% in only 52 minutes. And in a device this inexpensive it really stands out a lot that it has this much power. 
I highly doubt you're going to find a device that charges faster than this at this price point. Obviously it's not going to have wireless charging or anything like that because that's reserved for more expensive devices, but it does have an optimized charging system so that it charges slowly overnight in order to avoid rapid battery deterioration. The downside is that it doesn't come with a charging lock, which would be a way to protect the battery as much as possible. So if you want to be very careful, just make sure you don't charge it above 80 or 90%. Connectivity is what one would expect in this price range. It supports 4G networks. In this sense, it could be one of its weak points because some competitor may already start to introduce support for 5G networks, but sacrificing absolutely everything else. So in this case, we do not find support for that network yet, let alone support for eSIM. And Wi-Fi connectivity comes in at version 5, Bluetooth we have 5.2, and fortunately it does feature NFC so you could connect to other devices by bringing the cell phone back closer or make mobile payments via Google Pay or other compatible apps. It also has FM radio and it's a feature that's already rare though obviously you need to have headphones plugged in for it to play and use as an antenna. It also supports OTG so you can connect different accessories through the USB-C port and note that it also has wireless projection of its screen in an advanced way so it allows you to minimize the application on the cell phone and continue projecting it on the big screen or even have the cell phone screen off so it does not consume so much battery while you are doing the projection. And of course it is able to hide your notifications so they don't show up on the big screen. It can't do wired projection, but that's something much more advanced that we're not going to demand from a device this inexpensive. But it can connect to Android Auto via cable or wirelessly. And on sensors, although it has a very good amount including the geomagnetic field sensor, which is usually very rare in devices of this price, the only bad news is that its proximity sensor is virtual, so it can be a bit complex to activate. Generally, it's going to activate when it's very close to your ear. So this is one of its weak points, although it is something common in devices of this price range. But what is not common is that they all integrate gyroscope. So it has good sensors, only with the bad news of the virtual proximity sensor. In the ecosystem section, Xiaomi always tends to have a huge variety of devices. So this is possibly one of their strong points. Remember that currently they even have TVs, accessories for the home, for your pets, for personal life. And of course, they also have the Xiaomi pad, Xiaomi smart band, smartwatch, headphones, absolutely everything you want. Xiaomi has it. Although it must be said that despite being one of the most extensive ecosystems that exist today, they currently have little advanced interaction between all these connected devices. In addition, Xiaomi currently in Mexico does not distribute its laptop, although in other countries it does. Although it should be noted that Xiaomi also depends on several things from Google, such as its Quick Share or Google FastPay technologies to be able to connect to other devices or even to the same devices of the brand. So they don't use a very proprietary or very closed ecosystem and they also don't have Xiaomi Cloud on this side of the world. So the gallery now syncs directly to Google Photos. So it feels like it's pretty dependent on this company. Also on the home devices, you're going to notice that they have to be controlled through Google Home. Although notice that it also has My Home installed, which would be the app where you can connect all Xiaomi accessories to control them also from the cell phone. Let's talk now about performance and I tell you that this device has the MediaTek Helio G Ultra processor, a different processor, a special edition and yes, it offers us very high performance. In fact, in this price range, I think it will be impossible for you to find a more powerful processor than this one. In this case, it took 3.5 seconds on average to open each of these 16 applications. I think its performance is remarkably high considering the price range it's in. Obviously, it will not be an ultra-agile processor like what we will find in the high-end, but believe me, you can easily find this processor in much more expensive devices. Therefore, it is striking to see it in a device of this price. Also notice that it comes with pretty well-optimized RAM, although in this case we just saw the first application restart. I'm testing the version with 8 GB of RAM and believe me, it seems to be well-managed. Obviously, Xiaomi has a fairly heavy operating system that could get to saturate the RAM a bit on models that have 6 GB, but in this case, it seems that having 8 GB of RAM does this device very well because it manages to maintain a considerably fluid experience with very few app restarts, and that's something that you're practically not going to find on other devices of this price. 
The storage is also very remarkable since from the 256 GB version we find very good capacity and if you buy the 512 will be an exaggeratedly high capacity, especially considering that you can also place a micro SD up to a terabyte. So this is definitely a device that you are not going to fill easily with photos, videos and many other things. Now let's test how fast it can export a video with a total duration of 1 minute, joining several clips recorded in full HD. Done. It took less than 30 seconds, so we can say that it is a device with which you could perfectly edit full HD video with good speed. Finally, regarding games, note that it does have an application called Game Turbo, but it does not come natively in the list of applications, but you must enter the security application for some strange reason, but after you enter security, you can enter Game Turbo and it will tell you if you want to add the shortcut. Inside this application will appear the games you have installed. By the way, Xiaomi brings pre-installed several games that from my point of view are not very useful but you can uninstall them. In the upper left corner tells you the battery percentage and CPU consumption and in the settings you can turn on the maximum performance mode, noting that you also want memory exceptions that you do not want to be closed at any time. You can also have the do not disturb mode, so that even the automatic brightness, reading mode and screenshot gestures are disabled for a totally good experience. And when you enter a game, a sidebar will also appear from which you not only have the direct shortcuts to apps in floating mode, but we are also going to find other additional tools like a memory cleaner, as well as the do not disturb mode. And it also allows you to launch screenshots or video captures, as well as select a different mode of the screen color representation, or you can also start the wireless projection, and finally you can enable notifications in a totally different style so that they do not interrupt you. It also has a voice modifier for applications that support chat and finally some very focused timers for arena type games. In Call of Duty this device by default gives us the average quality at an average frame rate but we can go up to a high frame rate per second as well although not being a Snapdragon processor it doesn't have many effects available. Obviously it is not a very demanding graphic quality so the experience was totally good, extremely fluid, there is nothing we can reproach at the time we are playing as we will find a lot of fluidity although I insist that it does not have too many effects or graphic quality. But something to note is that when recording the screen the sound has a delay so that can annoy those who want to use this TVs to record gameplays. But if you are not going to record the screen while playing the result will be extremely good. Also consider that this sound delay bug could be fixed with an update. In the Legends game we changed the automatic setting to a medium setting simply because of the good performance it had had in Call of Duty, although for the price the ideal was to put it on a low graphic detail. But let's see how it does with this setting. In this case the first stage of the game took it even close to 90 frames per second, then it was very good. Although it must be said that there was a moment when it was limited to 60 frames per second and after that it maintained a very good stability. It is curious that this game allows more than 60 frames per second, although in its setting we set simply 60 frames per second. But it confirms to us that this device has very good power to run all these games. Even in this case we see good graphics, with all the explosions and everything to do with reflections, so it's a very good device for gaming because it even reports a very good temperature which doesn't get extremely high, not even annoyingly high. In the Spongebob game, by default there is the medium resolution and quality, and for this test the only thing we did was to go up to 60 frames per second to have an even slightly more extreme test. In this case, the experience was not as smooth as we would have liked, but we must remember that we are talking about a low-cost device, so we could not get so demanding. In fact, it will be very difficult for a device of this price to run games better than this one, at this same graphic quality. So, while it's not able to maintain a steady 60 frames per second in this content, at least most of the time it is above 30 frames per second. So, you can maintain a completely smooth gaming experience, though not ultra smooth as gamers would love. But either way it really is a very good gaming experience. Although it should still be noted that at the time of screen recording the performance again drops again. So I don't think it's an ideal device if you want to record gameplays. If you want to do exaction maybe you have to invest a little more money because in this price range you are not going to find any better alternative. 
in Henshin Impact, by default, this device has very low graphics quality. In this case, all we did was go up to 60 frames per second to see what it was capable of. Notice that it did quite well. It should be noted that it even went up to 57 frames per second at one point. Although it obviously doesn't maintain an extremely high experience when you're playing, but there are some fluctuations. But obviously in this price range we could not demand much more. In fact, there are many devices in this price range that are not compatible with this game, so it is a very good device to play while maintaining a good experience. In fact, we could categorize it as a playable experience. While it is not excellent and perfect, it does allow you a considerably smooth execution for you to play without despairing, since this device does not freeze at any time. And with this we have reached the end of this video review. Honestly, it is a device that seems to have very few flaws or very few things to improve. So I insist that it is a highly recommended purchase. But let me in the comments know your opinion. For the moment, we come to the end of this video. If you liked it, you know you can let me know. And we'll see you next time. <laughs>